Well, hello and welcome everybody to uh, our little celebration of Wesak, the anniversary of the Buddha's enlightenment, which apparently took place on the full moon of May, somewhat uh, around two and a half thousand years ago. Best guesses, I think, on that. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to start with a little potted history. Who was the Buddha? Why should we be interested in him? <laughs> and uh, and Jared's going to uh, offer us a little a little guided meditation, and there'll be time for for some questions too, hopefully. Um, so I'm going to kick right in. Uh, so we're here marking Vesak. Um, so I'm, so a lot of what usually passes for the life of the Buddha, the traditional story isn't isn't really history. Um, it's uh, it's most of it was written down by a, a, a monk called Ashvagosha who lived mm, five, six, seven hundred years after the Buddha's death. And Ashvagosha, before he was a monk, he was a court dramatist, uh, and that is reflected in the way that he's written down the story. So, um, but it's a good story, and, and, and even if it's not historically true, it has it has some spiritual clues. Uh, embedded in it. So, um, on this day, two and a half thousand years ago, perhaps, uh, a man sat, sat under a spreading fig tree and entered a state of deep concentration. In this state, he began a profound investigation of his experience. He saw clearly all the ingrained, habitual, and instinctual responses to experience that determined the shape of his consciousness and so the seeds of his further experiences and his further suffering. He saw that all humanity was like this. And with, and with this, a new perspective dawned on him, a new vision, something that would change him completely and utterly. Uh, it was like he had been asleep and had now woken up. So this is the man that we know as the Buddha, or more colloquially at, in his time, as the recluse Gotama. The word Buddha is a title, meaning one who is awake, in the sense of having woken up to reality. He did not claim to be a god or a prophet. He was a human being who became enlightened, understanding life in the deepest way possible. The traditional story says that he was born into a royal family in a small kingdom in the Indian Nepalese border. The story says that he had a privileged upbringing but was jolted out of his sheltered life on realizing that life includes the harsh facts of sickness, old age and death. This happens in a series of episodes known as the Four Sights. It's perhaps a bit unlikely that he'd got through to his late twenties without encountering sickness or, or people who were dead or spiritual seekers, because this fourth sight was the spiritual seeker, a wandering holy man, and there were a lot of them around in India, as there are now. Uh, perhaps it just sounds better than saying he had an existential crisis, but something happened that precipitated it is embarking upon his spiritual quest. There was some catalyst and uh, the four sites is the traditional account. In my own life, I can, relate to, I can relate to the sense of restlessness, of wanting something more out of life than the treadmill of education, followed by job, followed by family, children, retirement, death. <laughs> it was in a period of questioning that started in my late teens and went into my early twenties that I first came across Buddhism. Firstly in books, then in the occasional meditation class, uh, and then wanting to find out more. I liked the idea or the methodology in Buddhism that uh, you try a bit out, you see if it works, and then you try a bit more. Eventually the, uh, the Buddha Dharma, the Buddha's teaching, became the central organizing principle of my life. And, uh, so I was, and I was ordained into the Tree Ratna Buddhist orders, and that's where the name Lalita Raja comes from. It's not, a it's not a monastic context, but one that recognizes commitment over lifestyle. 
Uh, so the young Buddha-to-be was an aristocrat in a culture where succession could be a violent matter. Perhaps one can get some sense of him in the following passage, which uh, they think is one of the oldest pas passages in, in the writings that have come down. And I just get the sense from this, you know, there's this young man and, the, you know, he's, he's been groomed for being the next leader of his community, but there are many, many rivals and, uh, and poisonings and assassinations were not uncommon. Uh, so this is a, 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 a translation by Andrew Olensky. And this says, um, fear is born from arming oneself. Just see how many people fight. I'll tell you about the dreadful fear that caused me to shake all over. Seeing creatures flopping around like fish in water too shallow, so hostile to one another. Seeing this, I became afraid. This world completely lacks essence. It trembles in all directions. I longed to find myself a place unscathed, but I could not see it. Seeing people locked in conflict, I became completely distraught, but then I discerned here a thorn, hard to see, lodged deep in the heart. It is only when pierced by this thorn that one runs in all directions, so that if that thorn is taken out, one does not run and settles down. And perhaps rather than the, the traditional four sites, for me, this passage does speak to perhaps an existential crisis, like, how do, how do I deal with this situation? How do, I, how do I live in this? How do I get through this unscathed? So the desire to find freedom and to find answers to his questions led the Buddha to be to leave home. The traditional story says he crept out in the middle of the night with his charioteer without telling anyone, perhaps inspired by the wanderer that he's supposed to have seen. He exchanged his clothes with the beggar, cut off his hair with a sword and sent his friend back with his horse. However it was that he left, as a wandering holy man, he appears to have studied with some of the foremost teachers of his time, becoming adept at meditation and contemplative practices. And the story says that he exceeded their teachings in each case and, uh, and they offered him to become the co-leader of their community. Uh, and in the first case, he left and found another teacher. In the second case, he left and became uh, uh, focused on austerities, practicing austerities. Um, ascetic practices based on the belief that one could free the spirit by denying the flesh. Uh, he practiced so determinedly that a small group of followers uh, gathered around him and it said eventually he was living on one grain of rice a day. Well, he almost starved to death, that, that much practice we can, we can believe. But he realized that he hadn't found what he was looking for. He hadn't solved the problems of sickness, old, old age and death. He hadn't yet been able to remove the thorn lodged deep in the heart. He also understood that if he continued what he was doing, he would die before he uncovered the truth. A memory came to him from his child of, a, of sitting under a tree and watching the plowing in his father's fields. He was content and at peace and just spontaneously slipped into a meditative state, what we would now think of as a meditative state. So following the intuition that this memory held a key to further progress, he decided to try a different strategy. He ate some food and he sat down under a shady tree to practice. On the one hand, his determination seems undiminished. He's recorded as saying, may flesh wither blood dry up but i shall not rise from this spot until enlightenment has been won <laughs> who knows if he said those words but it's a nice it's a we're gonna, determination needed um on the other hand he was seeking a middle way between the extremes of the asceticism that he had been practicing and the hedonism of the pre of the privileged life he had grown up in so what is enlightenment 
What is this awakening? Buddhists believe that the Buddha reached a state of going beyond uh, anything else in the world. It is transcendent in that way. The Buddha's key insight is that in normal experience, everything is based on conditions. Our upbringing, our education, our psychology, opinions, perceptions, preferences, and assumptions shape and condition our experience. Nothing arises out of nothing. But enlightenment is supposed to be unconditioned. The Buddha broke through and the Buddha achieved this unconditioned state by breaking through the, the bonds of greed, hatred and ignorance. And he achieved this with, he needed strong concentration, you know, years of meditative practice, but also the reflective tools of insight meditation to the, the you know, that are able to um, enabled him to uh, see things in a different way. There's a whole there's a whole other talk under that three hour talk behind <laughs> to explain what all that means. But that's that's the thumbnail sketch. Okay, so in a way, the 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 reactive mind, the mind that is is operating in the conditioned way, uh, is is the mind that wants this doesn't want that, wants this, doesn't want that. So when we talk about greed, hatred and ignorance, you know, the part of the mind that wants is what we call greed and the part of the mind that doesn't want, don't want that. In a way, that's the basis of aversion or hatred. And, and, and ignorance is kind of not knowing what to do with it or, or, or deliberately not looking. Uh, but if you can just, I think even, you know, you can kind of, discover for yourself if you just kind of just sit quietly mindfully i think quite a lot of us have experienced some kind of mindfulness these days that if you can just sit in in, in, a, in a restful presence you know whatever tradition we're from we can we can kind of see the mind at work going this way and that way and this way and that way you know it's not buddhism doesn't have the monopoly on that insight uh, so um and if we can kind of sit in the middle of that and not react right, and just and just respond with, with with more presence more stability more even a kindly attention um that's when things start to change uh, into wisdom compassion and freedom so during the remaining 45 years of his life the buddha traveled through much of northern india spreading his understanding and his teaching is known in, in the East as the Buddha Dharma, the teaching of the enlightened one. We call it Buddhism, but there are no, <laughs> it's not an ism, it's just a, it's just a bunch of teaching, really. Uh, he reached people from all walks of life and many of his disciples gained enlightenment, apparently, and they in turn taught others. In this way, a broken, unbroken chain of teaching has continued right down to the present day. Buddha was not a god, he made no claim to divinity. He was a human being who, through tremendous effort of heart and mind, transformed all his limitations. If the per and he, in doing so, he affirmed the potential of every being to reach awakening. Buddhists see him as the ideal human being and a guide who can lead us all towards enlightenment. Um, yeah, I think that's all I'm, I'm going to say on that. <laughs> Uh, I could go on and on, but um, that's the thumbnail sketch. I'm just going to pause for a moment and just see if anything else, if there's anything else that pops into my mind. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, even if the Buddha never existed, there is that the unbroken chain of people trying to get awakening, trying to get enlightened and apparently succeeding and apparently passing on that on to the next generation and uh and, and in a way that's what that's what brings me that what's that's what brought me to buddhism it, it, it doesn't really matter whether he existed or not it doesn't really matter too much if the what what survives is the teachings is actually what he said but do they work try them out they've worked for me so i've just carried on with it so <laughs> that's yeah, just a little personal note at the end. Okay. Thank you very much for listening.
Thank you, LR. And so now I think I'll say a few words and then today we're going to do an actual meditation from the Buddhist tradition. But this meditation, for those of you who are coming from other traditions, I've, I've made great efforts to make it quite secular in, in approach. So it, it shouldn't conflict with your other commitments and, and views. Um, just very briefly, the, the technology, if you will, of Buddhist practice has three main elements. And the first is, is ethics. And ethics allows you to start turning your mind inwards and looking at your own mind. Because we have a tendency to chase after, as LR was saying, to chase after things and run away from things, to try to be happy. And ethics really forces you to look at your, yourself for the first time under, under a microscope. Because you're saying, I'm not just going to chase whatever I think is pleasurable and run away from whatever I think is pain. I'm going to live by certain principles. I think that's pretty relatable to everyone, I hope. And so this starts to turn your mind inwards and gives you some introspection, some mindfulness of what you're doing from moment to moment. And the second piece of technology in Buddhism is what they call bhavana, which is can be translated as to become familiar with. And what, what that means in, is often translated into English as meditation. Right, but when you say meditation in English, it's sort of like saying sports, right? The next question is, what sport are you talking about? What are the rules? What are the, I think you get the point. So the particular meditation that we're talking about um, uh, really comes in two flavors, but, but the main one for the purposes of our discussion is focused meditation, right? So, so first you've turned your mind inwards by living by certain rules and principles. And now you're going to turn the mind even more deeply upon itself by training the mind to focus on a single point so that your thoughts can be directed, your thoughts can be shaped, your emotional reactions can be transformed in ways that are beneficial, right? So, for example, you can generate your mind into a state of loving kindness, loving awareness, and hold it there deliberately for a couple of hours. And then when you go out on the street and you're interacting with a bunch of people you don't know or interacting with friends or a difficult person, it, it just stands to reason. You have a tendency to react more out of this loving kindness because you've become familiar with that loving kindness. Does this make sense? So first you do the ethics, then you develop concentrated focus so you can place your mind where you want it and transform the mind. And then you need to use analysis, right? So there's this other type of meditation, analytical meditation, vipassana, where you're, now that you have this highly focused mind, highly unbiased mind, you can now analyze your experience in a very detailed, unbiased way. As Lalita Raja was saying, you start to break out of these habits, the inclinations, the, the learning that you've already had, and you just look at it as it is, in the absence of all other learning and considerations that you've had and just see what's going on. You see? And then you see what's actually there, how it actually is, and then you live out of that. You respond to the world the way it is rather than how you hope it is or are afraid that it is or... Uh, does this make sense? So this is sort of the basic technology. So one of the one of the types of contemplative meditation that comes before this, I, I would say much more profound version where your, your mind is completely under your focus control and you can place it where you want and it stays there for long periods of time, you know, like the Olympic athlete version of this, is sort of a, a middle, middle version where you're contemplating a number of points in order that are meant to generate some type of internal state or some type of understanding. And then you use as much focus as you have to just hold each point, whether that's an internal state or an understanding for a period of time, right? So there's a sort of a middle category, contemplative meditation. It's not, not quite full analytic. It's not quite full stability. It's somewhere in the middle. So that's what we're gonna be doing today. And uh, 
the type of meditation we're gonna do, it, there's two kinds, right? One is like focusing on the breath where you pick an object that is not your mind and you focus on it with as much energy as you have. I think everyone's probably done like a yoga class and focused on their breath at some point, yeah? <laughs> is this again, hopefully relatable? The other type that's not often done in yoga classes and more popularly is what, what's called a subjective meditation. And this doesn't mean to say like, we're all gonna have some kind of different experience. We're trying to generate the same type of experience, but subjective meditation is when you generate your mind into a particular state, the subject becomes a particular state, and then you hold that with focus. So for example, you generate loving kindness, loving awareness, and then you hold that with focus. So that's the type of meditation we're gonna to do today. So, um, this meditation is uh, probably going to take us 20 minutes, maybe 25 if I'm a little slow. Is that okay for everyone? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through sort of the reasoned points and I'll pause at various places. And when I, when I pause, I may say it or I may not, but try to hold whatever internal state or understanding has been generated and just hold it with as much focus as you can without letting your mind wander off, as though you were holding the mind on the breath. Yeah, just hold the state that's been generated. And then we'll continue on to the next point. So let's begin. First, take just uh, 30 seconds, sort of straighten your back a little bit. Yeah, if, you, if you'd like, you can turn off your camera or you can, uh, you can stay here with me, either way is fine. Straighten your back a little bit, make it feel like there's a string pulling up from the top of your head, and then relax your shoulders down. And take just a minute or two to just be aware of your breath. Don't try to do anything. Don't try to count them or judge what's going on. Just, just be aware of your breath for a few seconds. I'll begin the guided meditation. When we analyze our lives carefully, it becomes clear that we're constantly driven by liking and not liking, and that we don't decide on, on those things that we like and don't like. Our mind decides on them for us. And it's quite obvious that we don't want pain or suffering. But what's not so obvious is that even pleasure is dissatisfying. When we stand up for too long, we find great relief in sitting down. But when we sit down for too long, the pain from sitting down becomes too great, and then it's a great relief to stand up. And like this, any, any pleasurable thing we do will transform from relief to boredom, to dissatisfaction, to pain. And most of our pleasures, if, if we were to engage in one of them continuously, like say, I think most people like ice cream. If you just imagine continually, you sit down and you just eat ice cream without stopping. Eventually, just the consumption of ice cream will lead to you passing away. And so pleasure and relief from pain by itself cannot be the solution to our ultimate fulfillment. Shantideva told a story of a young king by the name of Crete. And in his kingdom, everyone was barefoot. And uh, at one time he, he stubbed his toe because he's walking around barefoot as well. And, and as a young person without much experience, he thought 
so many of my people must be walking around stubbing their toes and stepping on sharp sticks and hot things and cold things. What a horrible situation. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cover the entire world with leather so that this will stop happening. And of, of course, we think this is a bit funny, but how silly indeed to try to cover the entire world in leather when you could just cover your, your own two feet. And it would be as if the entire world were covered. So like this, the solution to our desire to be deeply fulfilled is to turn the mind inwards and fix the mind rather than trying to fix everything that's wrong with the external world, all the places we might stub our toe in the world outside. And this is true, not just for us. This is true for all sentient beings. All sentient beings want to have lasting fulfillment and to avoid egregious pain and suffering, unnecessary pain and suffering. These are universal facts. We're all born with these two desires. Even arguably animals and insects have these desires we're all absolutely equal regarding these two desires, to be deeply fulfilled and to avoid unnecessary pain and suffering. So ask yourself, given that I am one and others are many, is it reasonable to put my own innate desires first before others? How could it be? I'm just one and others are innumerable, countless. And they have these same two innate desires, exactly like ourselves. Having thought about this, you may have some sense of equality between beings that's now arisen in your mind. To deepen that feeling and sense of equality, we're gonna do a short exercise. Imagine in front of you three different types of people, three categories of people, represented by three people that you already know. On your left is someone quite close to you, a family member, friend, mentor, a lover, someone that you feel very close to and intimate with and you, you care about a great deal. Notice your immediate reaction to seeing them in your mind, that feeling of intimacy. When you look quite closely, you might notice that across the course of your relationship with them, you've come to feel close to them due to the fact that they're kind to you, that they're, they benefit you. They give you things that you want and that you need. They relate with you, they agree with you, they help you. And so you feel this intimacy with them. Next, in the middle of your visual field, visualize a stranger. Maybe in the last couple of weeks, you passed someone on the street and their, their face and, and demeanor sticks out to you for some reason, but they're, they're a neutral person. Notice your immediate reaction to this person. If you saw them every day begging for change on the side of the street, you might care for a few moments that that you're walking by them and maybe it'd be nice to do something for them. But as soon as you walk past, you don't care anymore. They go out of your mind. 
If your close friend, on the other hand, were sitting on the street, you couldn't stop thinking about them until they were helped, until they were benefited. But this person you don't know if they were sitting there on the street, it wouldn't bother you at all. It doesn't bother us. As we sit here now, it doesn't bother us. In the same way for this neutral person, if you saw them in a cafe every day, you walked by, you saw them laughing with your with, with friends and so on, it wouldn't concern you at all that they were happy. It doesn't matter to us. Of course, if our close friend were happy every day, we'd be overjoyed. When we talk to them, we would go, oh, wow, I'm so glad you're happy. But this neutral person, we walk by and never give it a second thought. We don't, we don't care. This is called indifference. So there's a huge category of sentient beings every day, every minute, every second that we're alive that we don't care about at all beyond this extremely superficial level. Next, on your right-hand side, imagine someone who's harmed you. If you've done this meditation before, it can be someone who's harmed you quite deeply. If this is your first time, then pick someone who's only done something very superficial. You know, they, they looked at you the wrong way on the street, or they made a comment you didn't like once, or you know, something quite minor. And notice what's your immediate reaction to visualizing this person. You probably notice that you feel distant. You may even find it difficult to visualize them because you don't you don't want to see them. You don't want to see their face. If you think back, you can probably remember times that you wanted them to be harmed in some way or, or fail in some way. So there's a whole category of people like this that you feel quite distant from. And also you probably hope that they fail or, or that they're harmed or at a minimum that they're embarrassed in some way. So this third category, we can call enemies. And let's take a look and analyze closely. Do, do these three reactions that we have, this deep intimacy, indifference, and distance or aversion, do these three reactions make sense? For most of us, we can remember a friend who became an enemy. We can probably also, if we think hard enough, think of someone we didn't like at first that we hoped would fail and all of these things, who became a friend. Every one of our friends and enemies was at one time a stranger. And also, if we let our friends and enemies pass out of our mind and we move away and 10 or 20 years goes by, these people become strangers to us. So these three categories that we feel these deep emotions towards are completely interchangeable. And it's only because of these very sort of temporary circumstances where they've helped us for a while or they haven't done anything for us for a while or they've harmed us for a while that we have these very strong reactions to these three groups, very temporary. So what's, what's actually stable about all three of these people? All three people are completely equal in terms of wanting to be fulfilled. That deep fulfillment we were talking about is the same between these three. The friend wants this, the, the stranger wants this, the enemy wants this, utterly interchangeable, exactly like us. The reason that sometimes our friend harms us is because they're fighting battles with negative emotions in their own mind. The reason that sometimes the stranger harms us is because they're fighting battles with negative emotions in their own mind. And the reason the enemy has harmed us for a while is because they're fighting battles with us with negative emotions in their own mind. 
equal. The reason the friend helps us is because they have positive qualities they've generated in their mind. Care, love, patience. If the stranger were to help us, it would be out of these positive qualities of mind. If the enemy were to help us and go from being an enemy to a friend, it's because of these positive minds. So the real enemy is the negative emotions, the confusion, the internal battle, self-cherishing. That's the enemy. And the friend is these positive qualities, altruism, and so on. Other than this, these three categories of people are perfectly equal in terms of wanting happiness and wanting to be free from suffering and fighting these battles with their internal negative emotions, just like us. Shantideva said, uh, enemies such as craving and hatred, internal enemies, are without arms or legs. They're neither courageous nor wise. How is it? that they have enslaved me. All of our problems are related to seeing our own two innate desires as more important than those of other sentient beings. We're oppressed and enslaved by these self-cherishing attitudes where we put ourselves first. And because we're confused and we turn outwards to fulfill our innate desires, as we said in the beginning, we rely on pleasure to find relief we think that if we can just make the outer world right, the right car, the right house, the right lover, the right food, the right politics, the right health, and so on, that we'll be stable and fulfilled finally. But this can't be so. This is why people have midlife crises. They get all these things, and then they get bored. They get dissatisfied. They go through pain. And, and pleasure is revealed yet again to be dissatisfying and painful. And so they're deeply confused about their lives and they try to do something else. But in the meantime, this self-cherishing attitude that says, I'm more important, mine is more important, underlies every harmful thing that we don't want in ourselves and every harmful thing that we don't want for others. This inappropriate thought that I'm more important my desires, my needs are more important, underlie every harmful thing we see in the world. Out of this confusion that by acquiring the right things, that getting the right stuff that we can experience with our senses, somehow we're going to be happy. But it, it can't work. On the other hand, cherishing others, having good character, being honest, patient, loving, generous, selfless, are self-meaningful, especially when you commit to them over long periods of time, difficulty, with consistency. There's natural joy in cherishing others. It gives you a sense of lightness and ease, meaning, purpose, and bliss even, spiritual bliss. So when we cherish others, we fulfill the innate desire that we have for fulfillment. What other justification do you need to cherish others? Lama Zopa Rinpoche says, with the thought of cherishing others, you serve them naturally without difficulty. And in that way, even though you might be doing exactly the same things that you were doing before, even though your job or your actions haven't changed, because your attitude is different, Everything you do brings happiness, fulfillment, and joy. And just like that, self-cherishing is incredibly meaningful for you, but also brings about the joy and happiness of others. So universal loving kindness is extremely meaningful. So first, we discovered that 
when the mind turns outward to find happiness, it, it's, it's frustrated, it's confused, it harms others. When the mind puts itself first, we, we find that every harm that there is in the world comes about. We found that the three categories of friends, enemies, and strangers are actually interchangeable and completely equal. And we found that cherishing others is extremely meaningful, both to ourselves and others. And so with all of that in mind, now we're actually going to meditate on universal loving kindness, this mind that sees all sentient beings as being, or rather sees all sentient beings and wants them to be happy, wants them to have well-being. <clears throat> How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings had happiness and the causes of happiness. May they have these. I shall cause them to have these. Please give me the inspiring strength to be able to do this. As a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart, may I cherish all living beings. May I render powerless powerful negative emotions. May I crush self-cherishing. May I utterly remove even unmanifest negativities from my own mind. And may I become of perfect benefit to other sentient beings. If such a thing were possible, may I come to know the minds and needs of all sentient beings in vast detail so that I can help them exactly as they need at the appropriate times. May there be no global wars, no regional conflicts, no violence of any kind, near or far. May there be no poverty, no famine, no malnutrition, no thirst, no food or water insecurity of any kind, near or far. May there be no human trafficking, no slavery, no sexual abuse, no exploitation of any kind, near or far. May there be no injustice, no impression, no bias, no discrimination of any kind, near or far. May there be no harmful pollution, no destruction of natural beauty, no loss of habitat, no harm for the environment of any kind, near or far. And may there be no anger, no hatred, no selfishness, no harmful intentions in any sentient being, near or far. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings had happiness and the causes of happiness. May they have these. I shall cause them to have these. Please give me the inspiring strength to be able to do this. If such a thing is possible, may I gain the ability to be everywhere at once, appearing as exactly what each sentient being requires at the appropriate time. May I be food for the hungry. May I be drink for the thirsty. May I be clothing for the naked. May I be a sanctuary for the weary. Freedom for the oppressed. May I be medicine for the sick. May I be a friend for the lonely. May I be peace for those in conflict. May I be warmth for the cold, a cool breeze for those in heat. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings had happiness in the causes of happiness. May they have these. I shall cause them to have these. Please give me the inspiring strength to be able to do this. In gladness and in safety, may all beings be at peace. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near or far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at peace. Radiating kindness all over the world, spreading upwards to the skies, downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, may I sustain this loving recollection. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings had happiness in the causes of happiness. May they have these. I shall cause them to have these. Please give me the inspiring strength to be able to do this. For as long as space endures, for as long as living beings remain, until then may I too abide to dispel the misery of the world. May I liberate an ocean of beings. May I see an ocean of truths. May I realize an ocean of wisdom. 
May I purify an ocean of deeds. May I perfect an ocean of aspirational prayers. And may I work tirelessly for an ocean of eons for the benefit of others. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings had happiness in the causes of happiness. May they have these. I shall cause them to have these. Please give me the inspiring strength to accomplish this. Take a moment just to sort of relax, but don't don't fully disengage. Just relax into the results of whatever has occurred. Just notice your body. Notice your emotions. Clean, open, expansive, caring what happens to others. Notice your mind. Maybe after deeply considering the welfare of others, the mind is a bit more calm, free from fears, subdued. Notice whatever's happening. Okay, that concludes our session.